repeat it present no history of cough with hemoptysis or breathlessness past history patient was a known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus for the past 2 years who is on oral anti uh, oral hypoglycemic agents known uh, also he is known case of systemic hypertension for the past 2 years with uh, for he is on anti hypertensive drugs he is an not a known case of tuberculosis bronchial asthma shisha disorders no history of any significant previous surgeries or hospitalization for the same complaints personal history he consumes mixed diet bowel and bladder habits normal he is a not a uh, not an alcoholic or smoker family history no significant history suggestive in the family general examination a patient was moderately built and poorly nourished ecg performance status 2 uh, patient on pallor is ectric afibril bilateral pitting pedaledema present no cyanosis no clubbing no signs of liver cell failure after getting uh, a uh, vital sign uh, bp uh, 130 90 mm hg which is measured in uh, right arm in sitting posture pulse rate 90 per minute which is normal volume regular rhythm no abnormal characters temperature normal after getting proper consent from the patient the adequate exposure abdomen examined on inspection uh, abdomen uh, fullness noted in the epigastric and right hypochondrium umbilicus in midline position inverted all quadrants moves equally with respiration skin over the abdomen no scar no sinus no dilated veins no scratch marks no visible gastric peristalsis or intestinal peristalsis seen on head raising test the fullness noted in the abdomen decrease in size bilateral flanks free bilateral hernial orifices no visible calf impulse external genitalia normal bilateral renal angle free left supraclavicular fossa no fullness noted and palpation is no local rise in temperature an ill defined mass of size 8 cross 7 cm present occupying the epigastric region extending laterally up to 3 cm from right midclavicular line left side up to left midclavicular line the superior border is uh, could not be identified uh, below it is extending up to 7 cm from the zip sternum the mass which is regular irregular in shape nodular surface hard in consistency uh border of the liver is rounded swelling moves with the respiration hands could not be insinuated between the subcostal margin and mass uh, which seems to be arising from the left lobe of the liver and the right lobe of the liver is also enlarged up to 6 cm from the right subcostal margin the plane of the swelling is intra abdominal no other mass palpable in the abdomen bilateral flanks free bilateral hernial orifices no calf impulse external genitalia normal bilateral renal angle no tenderness left supraclavicular fossa no lymph nodes palpable percussion dull note a dull note over the swelling present which is continuous with the liver dullness uh, liver span is 16 cm no free fluid abdomen auscultation bowel sounds clear uh, digital rectal examination is normal sphincter tone no mass lesion or mucosa normal no bloomer shelf uh, normal fecal staining present. other other system examination cvs s1 s2 here no abnormal heart sounds rs bilateral air entry present cns no no focal neurological deficits <clears throat> summary a 58 years old male uh, uh, known case known diabetic and hypertensive for the past 2 years with the complaints of yellow discoloration of the eyes for the past 2 months which is insidious onset and non progressive not associated with pain fever with the significant loss of weight and appetite its uh, examination its patient was uh, poorly nourished moderately built and uh, ectric anemic with pitting pedal edema on both legs with the ill defined liver mass of size 8 cross 7 cm present in the epigastric region which is hard in consistency nodular surface rounded liver border which also moves with the respiration with the other uh, with the other systems are normal uh, diagnosis uh, probable diagnosis a case of liver mass probably due to primary hepatocellular carcinoma mm-hmm. uh, 
hello sir yeah that was a good presentation uh, over to the uh, surgeons here Okay, Jay, Jay, Jay Mohan, can I ask you a few yes, questions? Sir. Okay, so um, I think we will start with the management plan. So you have presented the um, the case presentation very well. So why do you say that yes, it's, uh, first of all, a liver mask? What made you think that it's a liver mask clinically? So clinically, uh, the mask was occupying in the epigastric and right hypochondric region, sir. Mm -hmm. And it's a elephant mask with... Uh, Fingers cannot be insinuated between the subcostal margins and the mass. And uh, percussion, the dull node present over the mass, which also extending uh, towards the extending along with the liver dullness. And also, it moves with the respirations. Good. Okay. So, 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 okay. So, your liver mass is your first differential diagnosis. So, what are the other possible differential diagnoses you want to put here? Uh, what are the, the mass is present in the epigastric region. Yeah. Epigastric region, sir. So uh, probably a stomach mass with and a pancreatic mass, a head of pancreatic mass. Um, okay. Um, so these are the two common possibilities which you say. Okay. So what do you? Why do you tell it as a primary hepatocellular carcinoma? Why not? It can be a, a cyst in the liver or a metastasis in the liver or anything else? Why did you tell that a probably a primary HCC? Uh, he's a 60 years old male, sir. Uh, old age person with a history of jaundice, non-progressive jaundice, sir, and also painless jaundice. Uh, and uh, no other history suggestive from pri uh, primary, sir. Any colorectal malignancy, stomach, or other uh, malignancy, no, other, no history suggestive. And uh, I know it's just a fever. So I'm okay. loading other primaries and uh, infect infectious causes. Okay, liver. so you, you, you are telling that it is a right, means painless progressive jaundice, right? So yes, sir. if this patient didn't have painless uh, non progressive, sir. Okay, so painless non progressive jaundice. Okay, so in the case of painless jaundice, if you didn't feel this mass in your abdomen, in the abdomen, what would be your yes, thought sir. process? If you don't feel uh, this mass, would be in very case, So what do you think? Okay. Good. Okay. And how common it is to have a, a HCC in the liver with jaundice? Is it common or not? Uncommon. Yeah, it is not common uh -huh. because yeah, it is not common. Okay. Fine. And uh, if you tell us uh, specific to HCC, what other important history, at least from postgraduate point of view, which you missed? What are the common causes of HCC? Sir, uh, our country most common cause is infectious cause, sir. Ap ap In hepatitis B. Yeah. And uh, uh, cirrhosis of liver, alcohol. Yeah, so, so you should ask about see, the, the causes which can cause hepatitis B, C, something like blood transfusions. Sorry. Yeah, receiving. You should tell a little more. And you have told about alcohol, but till till some little more in detail about um, alcohol. Okay. Okay. Before uh, going to the next step, uh, let me add few more points. Okay, uh, yes. if I may, uh, you said uh, yes, non. Yeah, you said non-progressive jaundice. Uh, how long you have yes, followed sir. the patient to say it is a non-progressive jaundice? You have seen only one visit. No? How long you have been kept the patient there? The what? Two weeks, sir. So two, two weeks. weeks. Two weeks. How many times you have done LFT? Sir, so I have done three days once. But you didn't mention anything in the history, no? So clinically, when you say you are, this is only a clinical history. Okay, yes, sir. from clinical history, what you are trying to do is you are getting the answer. From there, you are trying to backtrack and give a diagnosis straight away. See, this is why Dr. Vandiganan was also telling it is better to say differential diagnosis. Don't ever say primary HCC or anything. Just give a differential diagnosis and leave with that. Any question is put forward to you. You can say further, we will see the investigation. From there, we can come back. 
yes sir. you understand see now what you are trying to do is you have more information than what we have what you have presented you have more information in terms of progressive lfts which we do not have and you mean to say there is progressive non progressive jaundice yes so that may be a one flaw in your presentation next one is uh, you said bilateral pitting pedal edema and yes, uh, again you said there is no features of liver cell failure now i would put forward like this uh, liver bilateral pitting pedal edema itself is a feature of liver cell failure number 3 as yes, i said it is better to give a differential diagnosis rather than giving a single specific diagnosis. any epigastric mass you just simply say liver mass liver mass could be anything it could be benign it could be malignant anything number 2 you can yes, always say pancreas and stomach based on the anatomic locations yes sir that would be much a better uh, diagnosis at this stage at only history and examination yes sir okay yes. Sir. if i am wrong sir, sir can correct me also that is sir yeah what you say is i wanted to say that because this stage he has to give a differential diagnosis and another thing what i want to ask is uh, how, why are you saying that it is the liver mass can you differentiate clinically between a liver mass and say that it is not a, a pancreatic mass or a stomach mass sir liver mass uh, clinically the so mass is uh, occupying the epigastric region and the uh, uh, fingers cannot and a stomach mass both will, all three will occupy the epigastric region uh, mass moves with respiration sir pancreatic moves does not moves with respiration what about stomach a uh, stomach will moves okay so how do you differentiate between those clinically i am asking uh-huh. because a post graduate i am asking you you already yeah. answered this you can yes, answer one more time the presentation that's why i am asking uh if in, if in case of uh, stomach mass uh, upper borders will be palpable sir Is in it? this case my upper body is not palpable and example, there is a mass cannot be extending into the fundus will the upper body uh, upper border be palpable and percussion uh, impaired note will be clear sir in case of liver mass a uh, dull note will be present and uh, continuing with the liver dullness yes it is continuous with the liver dullness one point another one you mentioned that also not able to insinuate your not yeah. able to insinuate fingers ah, in a stomach mass and a pancreatic mass you will be able to insinuate your fingers yes sir. that is the main two points okay yes sir and don't give a, this one like hcc blindly no, you have to give a different diagnosis what anand says is excellent sir. go ahead okay sir yes sir yes. okay jay, jay mohan how, so how do you want to proceed in this case we'll discuss a lot about management rather than going back now so how do you want to proceed now sir uh, to confirm uh, my diagnosis uh, proceed with the investigation sir mhm uh, to confirm uh, i'll take a liver function test and usg abdomen and triple phase contrast ct so so you you will do an lft yeah you will do an lft yeah and then usg abdomen to confirm you will do an ultrasound uh, okay now you finished all your blood investigations one shot what all you will do ultrasound ab- ultrasound no. abdomen and con- triple phase contrast ct for what are you sir, sir was asking <laughs> blood investigation no you uh, finished all your complete- blood investigations protein blood investigation and hemoglobin Uh, rft a uh, central urea and creatinine a uh, liver function test and uh, viral markers very good and then in if uh, suspect uh, tumor i'll also t- also take tumor markers for this patient what tumor markers alpha fetoprotein and to rule out other prime any other prime is uh, ca and ca99 will take so yeah. every patient that walks to you you are going to do all these three investigations is it no sir <laughs> so okay. as you said there are two ways of presenting one you can say i want to come to a diagnosis yes. for that see you said uh, lft ultrasound straight away you jump to ct even without telling a renal function test that is why i said do all the blood investigation i don't i didn't mean yes. about the tumor markers at all 
at this stage uh, in your ms exam if you are going to say tumor markers they will be very angry with you now so at this stage what we would expect you to say is a complete hemogram a renal function sugars liver function coagulation profile viral markers that would do you get your ultrasound with this you can get your ct next based on whatever lesion imagine there is no lesion in the pancreas system why do you want to do a ce and ca99 would have saved lot of money with that right yes so jay mohan so always consider it as a real life scenario so the problem here is you are so much biased now you know you know the diagnosis and you want to go to the diagnosis just think that this patient is come to coming to you so what all you will have to so you won't order a tumor marker first time when you see a patient you know you won't yes. even know so there is a mass so you will do this test and then you will do a scan okay if this scan says so okay something in the pancreas then you will ask further test if this ultrasound shows a liver mass okay you will ask some other test okay so depending on that okay so you'll tell first what yes. you will do and then with this i will go further then what will what happens is the examiner will ask you okay so this blood test shows this ultrasound shows this what next then you can go okay so you can tell about tumor markers or you can talk about ct scan okay so the main yes. trick in the exam is you have to make sure that you don't know the diagnosis you have to take the examiner if the examiner knows that you are knowing the diagnosis then they will start playing around you then it will be very difficult for you okay yes sir yes okay so you do the blood test so basic blood test and uh, an ultrasound scan yeah so yes, from sir. the blood test so from the from the complete blood test from the uh, complete blood count what all information yes, you can get specific to this patient uh bilirubin value sir no from the complete blood count cbc so hemoglobin okay anemia okay so hemoglobin is there anything anemic. to do with the platelet counts in this patient uh, what if the platelet count is normal or if the say if the platelet count is say 80000 what does it tell you in this patient now you know the diagnosis hepatocellular carcinoma now he says the platelet is low that means there is some underlying chronic liver disease cirrhosis yeah, yeah so yeah, it, it, it is a, it is a marker of portal hypertension yeah portal hypertension yes sir yeah all which indirectly says that it could be a possible cirrhosis yeah cirrhosis yes Okay, so you do the blood counts, your renal function tests are fine. So you are doing an ultrasound scan, yeah. So what is the yes, motive of doing an ultrasound scan in this case? What are all you are looking for? To confirm where the masks are arising from, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, if uh, and if it is arising from the liver mass, uh, uh, rule out other uh, primary any pri- any other primary or uh, mass from the abdomen, mm-hmm. stomach and pancreas. Yeah. if i may say ultrasound is useless here am i right or wrong why do waste money on ultrasound straight away jump to a ct see remember now you don't know the diagnosis because you are fixated with the hcc you are stuck up here now remember if there is a gallstones your sensitivity of gallstones is ultrasound is 96% still it is a simple jaundice yes sir. okay Yes. Sir. So I am wrong. So you need to do an ultrasound abdomen. Ultrasound. Okay. Now you have the blood investigations. Can you present them here? You have the typed or something? I think he. No, I think he doesn't have the blood test reports. Yes. Uh, do you have the have reports blood. attached, uh, Jaybu? No, sir. No, sir. No, no. Okay. Or do you? I mean, uh, can you uh, give us a? Uh, uh, At least, how much was it? On that? Do you have an idea how much was it, sir? Jaymohan, only ten more minutes for you, Manne. We have to go to Dr. Mani and then. So you <laughs> have to be very fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Jaymohan, I will give you the scenario. Okay, so fine. Yes, so sir. your blood tests are all fine. Okay, your blood tests are fine in the sense the complete blood count is fine, and your LFT yes, says that the total blood urine is say ten. Yeah. the direct bilirubin yes, is 8 indirect bilirubin is 2 yeah yes, and yes, all of the uh, alkaline phosphatase is 350 all of the lst yes. markers are fine okay 
and you're doing an ultrasound okay. scan. So ultrasound scan shows, shows that there is a four cross five centimeter well-defined heteroechoic lesion in the left yes, lobe sir. of the liver. Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. And the liver, the rest of the liver looks shrunken and nodular. Okay. And there is moderate free fluid. Okay, sir. Okay, so what do you, how do you interpret this? Uh, a single lesion, sir. Yeah, so there's a single lesion, four centimeters, okay, uh, which is in the left lobe of liver. The rest of the liver is nodular and shrunken with moderate free fluid. Mm. So are you have happy with this scan? Is it leading to your... Your initial no, diagnosis or not or what? What what is your thought process with the scan? He said direct sir, blood urban is eight, this, indirect is two. This I cannot conclude with the diagnosis, sir. Okay, so what what all can you conclude in this? Okay, so LFT direct is uh, direct is eight and indirect is two. What does it say? Uh, more conjugated bleeding is more uh, means, arise, means it, it is uh, an obstructive jaundice. So obstructive yeah? obstructive okay. jaundice, sir. Yeah. So uh, in the scan, the, you asked, yeah. In the scan, you uh, told about two questions that you wanted to know. Yeah. Tell me, tell me. Yes, sorry. Uh, if this scenario shows obstructive jaundice, there's no stones and uh, and a biliary system will, will be if in case of normal a bile deck and uh, cyst. No, I Common have told the that. ultrasound scan report, okay? There is a yes. four centimeter mass in the left lobe of the liver. So that was your first question you asked for. So where it is, where the mass is arising from, I have told it is from the liver, okay? Yes. okay yes. And the rest of the liver is shrunken and nodular. It means what? What does it What does it tell you? Shrunken and nodular means? Cirrhosis. Yeah, it is cirrhosis. So cirrhosis. There is a, there is a mass lesion in the left lobe of liver with a cirrhotic background is, and with moderate free fluid. Moderate fluid fluid. Will you uh, can? Okay, so moderate That's free no fluid man. here is no. So moderate free fluid here is what I'm indirectly telling is patient is uh, having a mass lesion in the liver in a cirrhotic background with ascites. So this ascites could be because Portal. of a liver cell failure or what portal hypertension. Yeah. Portal okay, so with this scan, what is what will be what is your next test you want to do with this ultrasound scan? I will do contrast CT abdomen. Okay, so you have been repeatedly telling this. So why do you want to do a contrast CT scan in this? Uh, so mass, uh, whether to confirm is this is primary or secondary. Okay, so how do you confirm it is a primary or secondary? So, uh, in secondary salvage system, uh, by bilobar involvement and multiple multiple cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so so you 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 told that the it is probably HCC. Okay, so I think yes, sir. No, from the ultrasound itself, from the ultrasound itself, from what he has given information to you, I am still telling it is a pancreatic mass with a second piece in the liver. So how do you differentiate? You said CT to see whether it is primary or secondary. I am giving you a second differential diagnosis. That is a small pancreatic mass causing obstructive jaundice. And there is a secondary in the liver. See, when you say CT, say triple phase CT. Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear? So, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. So, I was telling about triple phase CT. So, why do you want Hello, to? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. So, why do you yes, want sir. a triple phase CT? So, when when your primary diagnosis is HCC, and when you yes, are sir. telling repeatedly triple phase CT, CT, can a triple phase CT confirm whether what you are dealing with is HCC or not? You can or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, what? So, what finding in the CT scan will tell you that it is a HCC? Sir, it's a hyper hyperplasion. So, it's a, a increased uptake in arterial phase and early washout in venous phase. 
very good so that is what you need to tell so that is the reason why you do a, that is why we call it as triple phase ct so what are the triple <laughs> phases in the ct scan what are the triple phases which we tell arterial phase venous phase and delayed linear delayed venous phase yeah yeah so what we need is a dual phase for uh, hcc so we need a arterial phase and a portal venous phase so the the hcc in the hcc the lesion will be hyper enhancing in arterial phase and arterial it phase. in the venous phase so this yes. itself is more than enough to tell what we are dealing is with hcc or not okay yeah? yes sir yes, okay sir. so say if this ct is showing such a finding okay it's, it is showing that the lesion is enhancing and it's washing out suggestive of hcc what next is that enough for you to confirm the diagnosis or do you want to do a test or a biopsy or something else this is enough sir no need for biopsy so ct scan is enough yes sir do you need so i so you need basically at least two things okay one blood test under ct scan or two imaging yeah so okay. in this case if i ask you to do a blood test what test you do alpha fetoprotein yes so here comes the alpha fetoprotein okay so you do an alpha fetoprotein levels and if it is elevated along with the ct scan showing this finding then it is it is hcc and there is no need for you to do any biopsy okay say for example afp is elevated and in your ct scan it is not showing the characteristic feature of a hcc yeah what will you yes. do he will do another image mri very good so you can do an mri or you can even biopsy it yeah yes okay fine so um so in this case what do you like to do what do you want to do how do you manage further this patient so you have got the diagnosis of hcc yeah and i have told that the liver looks cirrhotic Yes, sir. So uh, how do you want to manage? Uh, assess the liver function, sir. If uh, mm -hmm. if it is resectable with the uh, adequate functional liver. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. What is the size of the liver tumor? Ah, uh, in this case, eight cross seven centimeters. Eight cross seven centimeters, which is a very big tumor, right? Big tumor. What yes, is the sir. total? What is the total liver span? of this patient so he has you have told it 16 cm yeah 16 cm yes yeah. sir so 16 cm uh, by ct you mean to say 16 cm by the ct is it in, the, in ah, between like I told, so you told the liver exam. is palpable 16 cm from the subcostal margin it means it is so six huge 6 cm 6 cm from subcostal okay okay uh, but he said the liver is shrunken the liver uh, yes, as a nodular by ct wise you need to see yes, how sir. much is the liver remnant there you are going to go for yes, the liver resection straight away so you need to see the volumetry before jumping and saying hepatectomy yes sir and uh, when you say 8 cm uh, does it uh, fit into any other criteria uh, what would be the uh, no, best what would be the best treatment for cirrhosis What's the, cure for What's the cure for cirrhosis? What's the cure for cirrhosis? Transplantation. Yeah. Liver so transplant. Transplantation. Yes. So, so. So. You should consider a chance if this patient will fit into a as a candidate for transplant or not. That should be your first aim. Before saying some other treatment. Yes, so, how would you say this patient will be fit? or it will be fit into the candidate for a transplant sir uh, milan's criteria oh, wow wonderful very good <laughs> mm -hmm. good this is a single lesion uh, less than 5 cm in size or 3 uh, in size less than 3 cm in size with no lymphovascular invasion if uh, we can do transplant for this patient good okay mm -hmm. Uh, your criteria you know that should be more than enough. you don't have to tell more everything because yeah. uh, there is something more more than milan beyond milan there is something called ucsf criteria wherein even yes. up to 8 cm they can go on transplant so this patient will 
ideally fit into a transplant rather than uh, doing a hep H, uh, hepatectomy resection but before uh, saying transplant what uh, would you do i'll do staging of the disease barcelona according to barcelona liver cancer staging <laughs> <laughs> you you yeah. know more than us now. So, yeah, so, very good. So, so, yeah, so what you need to do is, so the initial management is, where, how do you decide on transplantation or resection is, you should know the, the functionality of the liver, okay? If liver. the liver function is good, so basically you categorize into child A, B, C, okay? In a child yes, A sir. patient where the functionality is good, you can still yes. consider resection, okay? So any yes, late sir. child B or child C patient, there is no role for resection. In that, for that matter, leave the liver resection. So in a child C patient, even if you go and do a hernia repair, again the the risk of life is very high. So patient will end up in liver decompensation and die. So in a HCC, if a pay, you are dealing with a child A liver. Okay, child A, yes, good functional liver, and if you think that there is a good remnant liver volume, you can consider yes. both, either resection or you yes, can go can. for transplantation. In a child, late child B or child C, you have only option of transplantation provided it lies within the criteria of melon or UCSF criteria. If it is anything beyond the melon or UCSF criteria, there is no cure for this and patient will come under palliative care, which involves all other options like doing a radiofrequency ablation or a chemo embolization or a radio embolization, yeah, yes, or things like that, okay? So this, in general, in, this, this is more than enough for a general surgery postgraduate to know, actually. But uh, during your course, did you say endoscopy as your investigations? If, uh, what is the role of endoscopy in uh, this? You never said a word about endoscopy. Sir, to rule out uh, other primaries. So your CT scan has already diagnosed it as HCC. Do you still worry about uh, the uh, stomach primary or something? Why do we do an endoscopy in any any, any liver patient for, for that matter? Uh, where is this bleeding? Portal hypertension. Where is the Portal bleeding? Hypertension. Yes. yes. So when you have a liver, say in this patient, if the CT scan shows us it is a normal liver with this lesion, okay, Yes. Even in that patient, any patient whom you plan a liver resection, you should do an endoscopy because there could still be a subclinical portal hypertension, yeah, which yes. can affect your outcome. So even if the liver looks normal in the CT scan, you should still go ahead and do an endoscopy to look for evidence of portal hypertension. And if a patient has portal hypertension, again, that is a that you that will be a very strong contraindication for any major liver resection. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yes. Is there any role for laparoscopy before uh, proceeding to liver resection? As part of your staging workup, you are planning for a major liver resection. You think the okay. rest of the liver is good, so you think uh, that should be enough. Can the peritoneal mets be picked up by your uh, routine CT? No, sir. Yeah. So if at all you are going to go for uh, resection, I think a better diagnostic laparoscopy can be helpful. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So the both the criteria which you mentioned for transplantation, the most important criteria is there should be no extra hepatic disease. Okay. In order to rule out there is no extra hepatic disease, you have to either yes, do a PET CT scan, whole body PET CT scan. Under or a diagnostic laparoscopy. Again, a PET CT scan, um, picking up a peritoneal metastasis by a PET CT scan is not that great, actually. So, diagnostic laparoscopy is best. Yeah, many times, patient who's taken up for transplantation for HCC, they'll go in, they open, and then they come out without operating also. You will find a peritoneal disease. Yeah? So, yes, I think at least at your stage, I think it's better to tell diagnostic laparoscopy. Diagnostic. Maybe a PET scan, yes. So you have to rule out there's no extra hepatic disease. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Dr. Partisan and uh, Dr. Anand. I think is there any more questions? No. I think I should congratulate Jay Mohan first of all. It was a 
fantastic presentation and uh, the knowledge which Thank he you, shared about uh, management is phenomenal from my side i a, a single a small advice is uh, try to take your examiner to your to the route which you want don't give uh, any uh, uh, answers which where, where he can start uh, questioning you as dr anand dr kartisan and dr manigandan was telling about when you are presenting on the uh, uh, summary uh, you you should not have a fixed brain or a, uh, you should not uh, convey that uh, show any signs saying that i have already <laughs> come to a conclusion so you should it should be always open and try to give answers where he will always come along with you so that other, other than yes, that sir. it was a fantastic presentation i i, I think i uh, hope hope everyone agrees to that so uh, yes sir thank uh, you thank sir. you dr jain mohan uh, i think you can yes. stop your screen share and i'm yes, making sir. dr manigandan uh, as the co-host now have you Yeah. yeah i think money uh, people are waiting for your uh, talk yeah. okay and uh, thank you dr kartisan and dr anand kanan for uh, 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 for taking up this uh, moderation even though online and at the last moment it is uh, Uh, and with uh, share your uh, questions with dr jay mohan uh, i think uh, more post graduates should come up and present uh, in such a forum where uh, stalwarts of uh, each field will question you and you will get confidence to present uh, because we all were exposed when we were post graduates to all gut clubs uh, all the ia gs ca size and <laughs> we'll be ripped apart by 20 to 30 people and uh, those gave the confidence for us to boost it up so thank you sir and over to thank you for the invite thank you thank you sir thank you sir. can you see my slides now thank you thank you we are able to see your thank you thank you sir we are able okay. to see your slides amani uh, we are able to see i think you have to press the present our mode that's on yes, your sir. top left press f5 F five, F five, yeah. So, can you hear me now? Can you can you see my slide first slide? I'm I'm yes. seeing your slide as well as the uh, uh, all the slides on the background. Oh, is it? I mean, just... yeah. Or you just come come out of it and share your screen and present. That makes more sense. Okay, resume share. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay now? Uh, no. I think now it's okay, but uh, still we are able to see your. Yeah, now it's okay. Now it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's but perfect. Why am I? Why am I not seeing any of your? I am not seeing There'll any. There will be what to say. Uh, videos. I mean, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, uh, Mani and then when you are going to present, you will not see any of us. You just think that we are there. Imagine okay, fine. Say. Because because I <laughs> no no you can yeah. huh? you can select uh, you can select uh, there will be a small viewer uh, somewhere in the yeah, bottom. Yeah, but it was there thing. in the evening. But it's fine. It's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Right. Okay. okay. So okay. so uh, first of so this topic is predominantly for the young surgeons um, and junior doctors in this group. Okay. And uh, first of all, thank you, ASA Trichy, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact with you all. and um for the next 40 of i just have 20 slides on this and i'll be speaking more and it's very very informal um for the next um 40 45 minutes i'll be telling about some basic guide uh, guidance about um uh, how and what are all the pathways for the uh, surgical trainee or a young doctor from india to move into the uk if at all if you think that you want to have any kind of surgical training in the uk So I am Dr. Manikandan Kalvel. I work at the Royal Free Hospital, London, and uh, I am a senior clinical fellow in uh, HPB Liver Transplant Surgery at Royal Free, and I am NHSPT accredited um, lead uh, National Organ Retrieval Service, Multi Organ Retrieval Surgeon, and I am giving this service to um, Royal Free Hospital, London, for the last two years. So I've been in the UK for the last three years. Yeah. So before going into the topic per se, I would uh, like to tell why this topic and why me and Rajivel chose this topic. The re main reason is um, we are in a situation or an era where 
uh, any doctor who is a budding doctor should sub specialize in some core area in their practice. There is, we have crossed the era that we have no more a general surgeon, no more a GI surgeon. So we should become subspecialized in a particular area, uh, at least at least in the next five to 10 years, even things in India will be changing. So um, so this with this background, um, uh, the options or route to get subspecialized in those areas is becoming more and more difficult and it's more and more becoming competitive. So. Um, Every one of us should know what are all the options available elsewhere so that if that suits you, we can go and take. So that's the main reason why we thought, okay, what are all the options for an Indian surgeon to get trained themselves in the UK as a topic for this forum. And to tell up front, this is not an advertisement or anything. It is just a guide or what I knew and what I encountered when I tried to move into the UK three years back. I'm just giving a guidance or a note to the young doctors in this group. So the objectives of my presentation will be, first I'll be telling about uh, why doctors generally think that they want to move into the UK. And I'll be telling about the advantages of a UK training in my perspective. Um, and what are all the basic requirements for any doctor before they decide that they can enter UK? And what are all the roles or options available to take up when they move into the UK? And at the last, I will tell very briefly about what is the lifestyle in the UK and what are all the drawbacks and some take home messages. So first to start with, why UK training? So in the last three years, I had received at least say 50 to 60 phone calls from um, medical students, postgraduate doctors, and even senior surgeons from India uh, asking for um, options for entering the UK. But when I ask them, why do they want to come into the UK? They give plenty of reasons for that. And um, most common reason among that is they all think that uh, coming into the UK gives them opportunity to focus on a particular area, which is right. And they all, to some extent, know that majority of the centers in the UK follow protocol-based treatment, and they would like to master this protocol-based treatment. Some feel that coming into the UK will strengthen their CV, and some come here to do their research. And from the financial point of view, uh, people think that once you come into the UK, they get better job opportunities and more salary. And few come in with an intent of setting into the UK, liking the lifestyle of people living in the UK. And some just come in because of peer pressure, just because a friend has gone into the UK, they just want to come in and have that tag to attach to their name. And um, many tell this, they tell that they're not happy with the Indian system for whatever reason. Um, one, because of the job insecurity, which I, which, which, is, which I see mostly after this COVID scenario. And um, other system is they don't get enough training or whatever, which, which the candidates say. And uh, the young doctors, they tell that difficult entrance exams for them to cope up the Indian, Indian entrance exam, that's a neat exams. And many don't have any reason, just like that they tell, okay, I would like to come into the UK. So these are all the common reasons which any doctor or a surgeon who wants to come into the UK put forth before they come in. But having lived in the UK for the last three years and working in the NHS doctors, in my perspective, what a UK training or a UK career gives you is, it gives an extremely a focused training. So unlike hospitals in India, where majority of the hospitals provide all kinds of service, here the hospitals are segregated into three things. One is a district general hospital. We have a regional referral centers and specialist centers. So district general hospitals are there once in every 50 to 60 miles, which offers all kinds of basic treatments. And um, if there is anything beyond their limit, for example, even any kind of cancer won't be can handled in the district general hospital. So, um, so all those patients who require any special care, including all kinds of cancers, will be referred to the regional hospitals, which handle only these referred cases. Similarly, we have very specific focused specialist centers in the UK, which handles only very specific diseases. For example, the liver transplantation is provided only by six uh, trusts in the UK. Okay. If you see pancreas transplant, it is provided by three trusts in the UK. If you see uh, bowel transplant, it's given by only two hospitals. Apart from the transplantation um, field, if you take, say, uh, a focus thing in the, say, an upper GI, in the upper GI, we have two or three centers which specifically provides robotic esophagectomies. 
We have specific centers which handles only the motility disorders of esophagus. We have special centers for uh, oncoplastic breast reconstruction centers. We have specialized centers for inflammatory bowel disease. We have specialized centers just for pelvic flow disorders. So all these hospitals are segregated and the cases are just referred to these centers where they are managed. So if you want to train yourself or if you want to master a particular area of your field of interest, I think UK is best in that. So you go into the hospital, you stay there for six months or a year, you will become a master in that. So that's the main advantage which I think the UK career gives you. And the second important thing is you will master the MDT approach, what is not, that's nothing but the multidisciplinary team approach. So all the treatments and decision plans, whether it is a benign or a cancer, always goes through an MDT pathway where uh, the cases will be discussed and the collective decision is made. So this gives an opportunity for the doctors as well as for the patients for a better outcome. And the most important thing which we all lack in the Indian scenario is the communication skills. So the practice in UK, starting from the exams which they conduct to enter the UK, they give more importance to maintaining confidentiality and the communication skills. So starting from the clinic appointment with the patient and getting the consenting, we spend more time talking to the patient and developing relationship with the patient and gaining confidence from the patient, um, which is again more and more important, at least for the budding surgeons now, because the, the era of telling the doctors are gone is gone. So now in order to safeguard ourselves from any kind of medical legal problems, we need to be very, very open to the patient. We need to tell everything. So I think uh, your training here in the UK will give this skill enough. And then it opens up the global opportunity. So um, if you get trained in the UK, your options across various centers in the world opens up. So for example, your training in any kind of training in the UK is recognized by Singapore, is recognized by Australia, and majority of the European countries. So it gives you an opportunity for you to go and work in multiple areas. And then uh, the most important thing is, uh, although I don't practically feel that this is true, um, I'll see from my point of view, the training which we have in India or the practice which we have in India or the skills we have in India are the best. There's, there's no superior thing in the UK. But unfortunately, your six months uh, job in UK or one year job in UK adds more strength to your CV than whatever degree you get in the um, you get in India. And uh, again, uh, the, 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 the unhappy thing is except for our MBBS degree, which we get in India, the MS or MD or MCH, none of the degrees are recognized in any other major universities across the world. But your training in the UK or your basic, say an MRCS exam, gives you, uh, opens up your gate for most of the countries in the world. And then the most important thing is you will have an opportunity to do very quality research. You can get some very good publications and you will understand the importance of audits and doing an audit. Again, even if you go back to India, we are all slowly moving towards this era of seeing what we have done and how to improve ourselves by seeing our own results. So the, the concept of audits is still it's coming up even in India. So this gives an opportunity of learning how an audit is done, how an audit is interpreted and how an audit is executed. And the other thing which I felt fascinating is network building. So UK is a hub where doctors from many countries come and work. So you develop friendship with many people here. You get opportunities to travel around. You get opportunities to know the culture around. So for example, I had an opportunity to go to Cyprus for uh, two weeks and observership through one of my um, friends. So network, it gives an opportunity for network building. And it's a completely a different health system where um, everything is prioritized. So if you have a cancer, you get your treatment quick but if you have a benign problem, you have to wait. And um, whoever it is, whether it's a rich or a poor, or you have influence or not, everyone are treated the same. Whereas just for a small example, so I took my kid to the a &E of my hospital three weeks back because she fell down and had a problem in her foot, in her, in her hand. So they didn't even recognize me as a worker there. So I waited for eight hours for a doctor just to see, and then another four hours for an x-ray. And then by the time I came out, it was 16 hours for me waiting in the a &E. So everyone are considered equal. Yeah. So this is all we get when we do, when we train ourselves when we come into UK. This is from my perspective. 
again it's a good lifestyle it means i wouldn't say good lifestyle but it is a different lifestyle of what we have in india it is a bit stress free and you have a fixed time job between 8 to 5 or whatever and beyond that no one is going to disturb you and you have a reasonably a good income for especially for doctors to have um, a good reasonable uh, life here in the um, UK. Okay, so with this background, so before, so what before you decide that okay, let me try UK, let me go into the UK and see uh, what this country offers to me. You should answer all these questions. Without the answers to all these questions, you cannot decide what pathway you should choose. So first of all, what you need to know is how long you you are planning to. Oh, long, ma? Sorry, okay. Ah, path it for. Sorry, Will. Hello. Can you hear me? Mani, uh, so, sorry, uh, it was Dr. Rajiv Raj, uh, not senior. I, I welcomed him and I muted him. We are clearly hearing you. Okay, okay fine, fine. Okay, fine. So before deciding to move into the UK, so the things which we should answer to ourselves is, how long do you want to stay in the UK? And what is your purpose? So whether your purpose is to go train in a particular area, or you want to go and experience a different health system, or you want to go and have some lifestyle with your good quality family time, or you want to settle down in UK. So you should know what is your purpose. And the most deciding factor in this is how is your family adjusting with you? So are you going alone or you will be taking your wife and kids? How many kids you have? What is your support your family has? So these are all the factors which will um, make you decide whether uh, you can do this or not. And then the most important thing is you should have contacts here. So um, getting a job into the UK does not come with just your paper. So you should have contacts here in a particular. So if you're applying to a particular hospital, if you get to know a consultant there or any working person there, it is easier for you to get into the hospital rather than just waiting, uh, applying and uh, applying for the post and wait for what they say. So you should have, if you have good contacts, the chance of you getting a job in a good center is much, much easy. And similarly, you should know what is your strength. Just because you, we have, you have done your MS or an MCH, it doesn't mean that you are confident enough in doing um, whatever skills you learned. So if you think that, okay, if your skill is less for a general surgeon after passing an MS, then you should select a particular kind of a job which will help you building that. So as I mentioned to you before, all these centers are very, very specialized. So if you take a specialized center, say if you take a senior clinical fellowship post in a particular hospital, they will expect a minimum requirement from you. And if you don't give that, you will be neglected in the system. So you should know what is your strength and which level of post you can apply for or which level of training you can get in for. And Similarly, the last thing is, what is your long-term plan? Again, it's a very difficult question to answer. People come in with the mindset of going back within a year, but you come in, stay for three years, four years, and then people stay here. But at least you should have a rough idea of, okay, whether you, you want to come back to India or stay here or make further plan. So, so this is all the questions which you should answer before you decide to go into the UK. So now the next few slides will be concentrating only on what is needed to enter the UK, okay? So the basic eligibility to enter the UK either for training or settling down or whatever in the medical profession is you need a general medical council registration. It is like an um, in the Indian Medical Council registration or Tamil Nadu Medical Council registration. This is called the GMC registration. Here the difference comes between the US and the UK. So in the US, so whoever it is, whether it's a super specialist trainee or whatever, you need to write your USMLE exam. And from there, things get diverted. But in the UK, there are multiple ways through which you can get the GMC registration. And these are all the four, four common ways through which you can get. And the most common thing is the PLAB exams, um, which is the most common route, which very young doctors like, say, um, MBBS students who come into the UK, they take up and very few postgraduate students also take up if they think that their Royal College exams are difficult. And the second thing is the Royal College exams. So for surgeons, the MRCS exams. So once you clear the MRCS exams, that gives your green light to apply and get the GMC registration. So that's the reason why I did my MRCS exams in 2014, um, thinking that if at all, if I plan to go into the UK in the future, I will use it for my GMC registration. But 
to be very frank, except for surgical specialty, all of the specialty like pediatrics or radiology or medicine or whatever, they prefer to do FLAB exams rather than their MRCP or MRCPH or whatever, because their Royal College exams are much, much difficult. But from my point of view, the MRCS exams are um, much, much easier than FLAB exams. And the third thing which comes here is the MTI. So MTI is, it's a question which many of the doctors call me and ask. So MTI stands for Medical Training Initiative, which is an initiative made by the Royal College where they give temporary registration for 24 months. So you need to apply directly to the Royal College and they will, um, um, uh, what to say, so they will consider your application and they will give a temporary GMC registration just for two years and they will give you placement. So you come in as a fixed time contract visa, you come into a specific unit, you work here and you have to go back in 24 months. So this is called medical training initiative and for this, no time exam is needed, no Royal College exam is needed and uh, in the last year, at least 60% of the MTA seats were occupied by the in Indian medical graduates. So this is one of the good opportunity for any Indian medical graduates who, who just want to come in for a fixed period of time, do it and go back. So MTA is an option. And the final thing is a sponsorship, which is extremely unlikely to happen. So if, for example, if you know any very senior consultant in any of the trust here, and if he is happy to sponsor you, sponsor you in the sense, if he is happy to give in writing, telling that your training in India is in par with um, the local trainees in the UK, then the Royal College can consider those applications and they can give a permanent um, uh, uh, registration under GMC, but it's very, very, very rare. And as I told you, you should have very, very strong links and contacts to obtain this sponsorship. So this is about GMC. So, so once you clear any of these examinations and for the GMC application, it's not just the examination which is needed. What else is needed is you need to clear IELTS exams. Again, the IELTS exams comes in various modules and the module which we need to take if you want to practice here as a doctor is IELTS UKVI academic. This is the exam which you need to take. And again, from my point of view, and this is the opinion which I got from many of the doctors, IELTS exams are much, much difficult than MRCS exams. So uh, to be very frank, I failed three times before I got clearance in my fourth test. So again, all these exams are very, very costly. Um, so the major hindering factor or your time limiting factor in your GMC applications will be the IELTS exams. And the second thing is ECF, ECFMG or the EPIC. So basically GMC doesn't accept our MBBS just like that. So they had outsourced, it, outsourced this to the ECFMG Association, which is in the US, which does the um, job of um, approving uh, that our basic medical qualification is genuine or not. So you need to open an account with these guys and we have to apply our MBBS degree and they will verify whether our MBBS degree is a genuine degree or not. So these are the two things again, which is a late limiting step, but these two, are, two things are the ones if say an MBBS doctor or an MS postgraduate who, who sort of strongly has the feel of going into the UK, they, they can do these things whenever they have time. So they can do this and make things cleared up. And for the IELTS exams, once you clear the IELTS exams, you have um, a duration of two years to use this um, um, marks. And then you should have references for GMC application. We need at least three uh, references, very strong, good references, um, preferably from your unit chiefs. And if possible, if one of these references had a previous UK training or a previous active GMC registration, then that adds more. And you should have a basic medical degree, which will be our MBBS, and the gaps in the employment. So the, the GMC application itself is something like a 30-page booklet, which you need to fill. And they consider very seriously if you have an unexplained gap in your training or employment. So you should be very, very careful in filling this. If you have a gap of more than six weeks, you should be careful in explaining why. And the most important thing with any kind of UK things, you have to submit enough evidences to tell that you are very genuine. And along with that, you should have PLAB and Royal College exams and MTAs on 
sponsorship. So these all are the basic things which you which you should have before you apply for GMC registration. The most important thing which I would advise the in graduates here is when you fill up the application forms, it is always advisable to speak to some person who knows this because even a small error or small uh, issue with the application, if there is a rejection or if they send the application back for verification, it takes so much time. The, the normal processing time for GMC application, at least in the, during the pre-COVID period was somewhere around two to three months minimum. And if you have problems, then it, it all delays of things like that. So if you are really thinking that you want to do this, speak to someone who has already done and um, get help out of that. Okay, so once you get the GMC registration, what next? So what are all the roles available for you? So these are all the roles which you 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 see the people from the UK tell. They may tell that they are the deanery training. Some tell you that they are an SHO. Some tell you that they are a junior clinical fellow, senior clinical fellow. Some tell that specialty doctor, specialty registrar, and there are some named fellowships. So, so these are all the various roles which any trainee can take, any trainee or a training person can take. So the first thing trainee is basically like India, it is like a structured training program where, um, um, where people do a foundation um, year training. Foundation year training is like our internship. And once you finish your foundation year training, like the, after our internship, you apply to enter the surgical speciality and then you enter into the course, course specialist training, which is the course surgical training, which is for two years. And again, you need to apply uh, for something like, if you, want, it means if you want to go into a specific speciality, after the end of two years, you apply into this and then you enter the specialist training. So this is exactly the duration of what we have in India. So for example, after the medical schooling, we have an internship of one year, but here this internship period is something like two years. And then, so I would say the core specialist training year one and specialist training year three, we can consider it as something like an MS or an MD, and then comes like the MCH or the DM and then some training. So. This is the minimum duration of training which is required before you reach what is called as a CCT, which is called as a completion of training. So completion of training. So once you finish CCT, you will enter into something called as a specialist register. So only when you enter into the specialist register, you are uh, eligible to become a consultant, okay? So this is the curriculum which I had put up for the surgical specialty. If you want to go into any other specialty like a cardiothoracic surgery or plastic surgery, you have something called as a run-through program. After your medicine, you give your exams, you enter year one, come out at year eight as a CCT. So you don't need any of these breaks. But if you want to do a general surgery or an internal medicine training um, as a proper trainee here, these are all the things. Again. So in what way you can enter this training system, you can write either PLAB exam and enter the foundation year. Or if you had done an MRCS from India, and if you have a competency signed for all these four years, you can straight away join ST3. And from ST3, you work for five years under some speciality, and then you get your CCT. So here comes the FRCS exams. So in the UK, for entering, so at this point, from after the course specialist training, to enter the specialist training, you need MRCS. So without MRCS, you can't enter the specialist training. Similarly, before you complete your core training, that is a CCT, you should have FRCS. So that's the reason why I have both MRCS and FRCS. And every trainee, surgical trainee from the UK, they will have both MRCS and FRCS. So MRCS is the entry exam and FRCS is the exit exam before you complete your surgical training. So in this way, this is a very, very safe way. And this is the way I would advise people to take um, if they don't have a fixed duration of stay in the UK, if they say if they're happy to spend five to six years in the UK, they should take up this way because the advantage is at the end, you will reach the CCT easily, you will enter the specialist register easily, and then you can become a consultant easily. So this is the training pathway. And the, the second pathway is the junior or the senior clinical fellowship. This is the most common um, um, kind of a module which is taken by the international medical graduates 
if they want to just spend one or two years in a particular field, train themselves and go back. And this is the reason why I took this post. So I took the senior clinical fellowship post, which is equivalent to SG8 or a senior registrar of the local training. So this is, so it is in, if you take the UK hierarchy of um, work, so senior clinical fellowship just comes just beneath the uh, consultant level post in the UK. So the junior clinical fellowship means junior, junior clinical fellowship is something like uh, a post which uh, say a general surgery trainee or a post MBBS doctor can take and the senior clinical fellowships of those fellowships which can be taken up by um, specialist trainees or say a general surgeon who had worked for three or four years, they want to come in and take uh, a particular uh, specialty here. Again, these posts are very, very temporary posts. It comes as fixed contracts. So, and the, the minimum contract for these kind of jobs is one year. And um, you come here and you will get a visa sponsorship for one year. You work for one year and go back home or you can get another job and go. So this is the most common pathway which majority of the Indian trained surgeons or the surgeons who come here take up. And to access the jobs, we the most common um, uh, the, the, the uh, websites use is the track jobs or the NHS jobs. So you go in, you fill in your details, you can fill in what kind of job you look for and in what speciality you look for and you will be notified every day and um, whichever you are interested you apply for it again as i told you before you should have a gmc registration before doing any of these things and um, i can tell you that the job opportunities are too much in the uk there's no difficulties in getting any kind of job whatever you want depending upon your your uh, skill but only thing is you should have a proper contact and you should know the technique for getting the GMC and technique for filling the application forms. So, so all these application forms, whichever comes again, it, it is a package of say 15 to 20 pages. You need to fill so many things. But again, the technique matters because when they shortlist these applications for the interview, they have separate points for each of each section of the application and they give weightage for specific things. So majority of our candidates who they, they call me telling that they have not so they have been applying for all the posts they have not even called for a single interview but when you go back and see their application it will be nothing so so they should know what they are looking for in the application so if you are a first time applicant applying for any kind of job in the uk i would advise again to get or speak to someone in the uk or someone who has had these experience before get their um, advice on this and go similarly again the interview pattern so once you're shortlisted once you're invited for the interview again they have a specific set rules of how uh, the candidate will be evaluated on the day of interview so um, again it's always better to speak to someone get some um, learning on uh, how to attend an interview in the UK and then go in. So once, and these things are not difficult at all. It's so, so simple. Uh, that's why I tell that. So if, if, if you are finding it difficult to get an MCH or a DM post, I sincerely advise you to take up any of these fellowships, come into the UK, and um, I can promise you that you will be considered better than an, an MCH candidate or a DM candidate once you go back home or you go back to any other country. So after all these things so you so these are all the options again as i told so so if at all if you decide to settle down in the uk and if you want to become a consultant there comes the problem because the system here is set so easily for people to come in and train but if once when the thing comes as for consultant they are very 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 stringent and there are so many rules which comes in and they give more priority to british candidates and the european union candidates than uh, non-european union candidates but still it is not impossible yeah but again if if you have the um, thought process of becoming a consultant or settling down here the best way is to take the trainee route so get take, take this trainee route and then finish your training and you get your um, um a cct and then you can apply and there is another route called CSA. so something like say for me who has done so much of training back home i don't want to come here and start my training again so they have an option something called CSA, where i can give enough evidences to the British Council telling that I have enough evidences equivalent to a trainee who completed their training here and they might consider the application and they can award me a 
place in the specialist register. But this process is very, very, very tedious. And the success of this process is very, very minuscule. So if you have a long-term plan of settling down here as a consultant, the best way is to take the trainee route. And as I told you, the MTA stands for Medical Training Initiative. And if everyone, anyone is interested in this, you just type in Medical Training Initiative that gives enough information about how to apply, what are all the options available. And as I told you, this scheme doesn't require you to clear lab exams, doesn't require you to do MRCS exams. You can select specialty. Say, for example, uh, every year, a candidate from Madras Medical College comes into King's College to get two years of training in liver transplantation. So, so something like that, all the specialties are available. What a specialty you want you can apply and you can get it done uh, and this comes with just a temporary registration you will be given a gmc registration for two years and at the end of two years you have to go back so this all in a overview about what are all the ways through which you can come in and what was the career options in the uk so uh, i have not gone in detail about what is plab what is how mrcs is written and things because each one it's a topic by itself so i'm just giving an overview so the next thing which i want to tell is okay having got a job the next doubt which all have is how is the lifestyle in uk how easy it is to live in the uk so from my point of view any post chair is well paid. So uh, an FY1 doctor here or an internship doctor here is paid at least 2,800 pounds a month, which is equivalent to 2.8 lakhs. Um, I can tell you that the cost of living here is very high, but still this is more than enough for you. So for me, uh, say I am a senior clinical fellow, if say if I get a 5,000 pounds a month um, here in London, for me, the expenditure is somewhere around 2,500 pounds a month and still I could save like two. And this is with me and a non-working wife and I have two kids here. So you have a good pay. And then if you want to make even more money, you have something called locum shifts. These are all the vacancies, which is available every day. You go to various hospitals, you do some shift and you will be paid like anything. Uh, to, for a basic example, if you are doing an SHO job or an internship job in a department for a night, you will be paid something like around 250 pounds, which is like 25,000 rupees per night for a 10 hour job. And then the other lifestyle is it's a fixed time job. So you go on your fixed time of your duty and um, you do your work properly. It is not like you can scoot there. You are, your work will be monitored. There won't be any place to sleep. I can tell you that because um, the night shift persons are not expected to work in the daytime and during the night shift, they're expected to work. And there'll be a constant surveillance of what we do and what we uh, what we are doing. And the, if you are coming here with the children, you have schools which very, very good schools uh, in par with a very costly school in India, very good schools, where, which is completely free. Your healthcare is completely free. And if you are bringing your wife as a dependent here, um, they can work as anything except for a doctor or a dentist. Still, if your wife is a doctor or your husband is a doctor, they can do locum shifts and they can get paid. And UK has a very good connectivity to um, India. So this is in gross about the lifestyle in the UK. But what are all the drawbacks? So everything comes with a, a pinch of salt, you know. So, so the drawbacks is the initial thing, you know, before entering the UK, you need to invest some money, you know. The, the IELTS exams, uh, each exam costs something around 30,000 rupees. And as I told, if unless you are a very smart or a very good guy in an English, it is so really difficult to pass the IELTS exams in the first attempt. So you'll be spending at least like 50 to 60,000 in your IELTS exams. And then if you want to clear your FLAB exams or MRCS exam, which comes to around, around 1.5 to 2 lakh, and then GMC registration and your travel. So before you start your work, you will need a minimum of three to four lakh rupees to come in. But uh, you will be paid enough. And then the processing times for everything, starting from your GMC application or your exams, everything is so, too slow. So from the time you apply for a job and you get a job here, it takes at least like eight months to a year. And then the interviews, I wouldn't say difficult, but um, for, a pe for, pe for candidates from India who don't have this um, interview kind of a system in India, because we all go with exams and marks, we don't have interviews. So we need some kind of training and we need to know um, the techniques in these interviews before we um, apply for this. And then the fourth important thing, which everyone suffers here is no support, you know. So me being here with my family, I have to look after everything. I need to look after my home. I need to clean my toilet. My wife has to do this. And I don't have any many elderly support or for my kids or something. So you will be helpless here. So these are all the 
uh, drawbacks which I want to put up. So the take home message which I want to tell every every young graduates here or the young doctors here is you should keep your options open. Yeah, because the as we go move on from here, the competition is going to be more and more severe. So you need to win the race and you need to showcase yourself that you are a specialist in the field. So keep your options open. And whenever you get time, try to verify your basic medical degree with ECFMG, which will be very useful. And I would advise all the um, surgical grad, surgical postgraduates to clear their MRCS exams, not only to enter the UK, but it gives the, gives the chance for you to enter uh, any country, majority of the country where you want to say Singapore recognized MRCS, Australia recognized your MRCS degree. So most of the, even China, even um, I think Hong Kong recognized the MRCS degree. So so your MS degree is not recognized, your MCH degree is not recognized. So clearing MRCS gives you weightage in your CV. So it opens up your options. Similarly, there are many um, institutes in the country which pays more salary for an MRCS pass candidate from a non-MRCS pass candidate. Similarly, in the Gulf, you will be given more preference if you have an MRCS degree. So basically, MRCS is nothing but it gives you an international certification that you are a you are a um, um, what to say a skilled um, skilled and a safe general surgeon. That's what it says basically. And then try to get help and guidance from seniors who have already done these things. And my most important advice is never waste years in your training career. Try to finish or reach your goal first and then try to train wherever you want. Don't waste time telling that you want to do this or that. It's not going to add you anything. And try to build your CV from your early part of your career. And again, uh, as an Indian uh, trainee, we all lack in publications, research and audits. At least now, it is good to see that um, many private institutes and hospitals are coming up promoting or um, helping the students in doing publications and audits. So try to do these publications, uh, few publications, try to do quality research, try to do audit. So all these things adds up too much to your CV. And when you go out of India, these things gives you a lot of rewards. And similarly, whenever you have time, attend uh, research, attend courses on uh, research methodology, teaching techniques, leadership courses, basic life support, and uh, ATLS. So again, these courses gives you many points for you to score when you come out of India and when you apply for any kind of um, jobs. So this is all about today's presentation. I am very happy to help and me along with a few of my colleagues who are here. We have been doing um, this jobs in the form of guiding people um, in the MRCS exams, helping them to write their CV, um, helping them writing their applications, helping them how to attend the interviews and things like that. So I am very happy to help you. And this is my contact number. You can contact me in WhatsApp or Facebook, or you can email me and uh, I'm very happy to uh, help you. And I hope, I think Rajavel would have recorded this presentation and I would uh, uh, advise him to share this in a forum where um, young doctors can access it. So I have not gone through in detail about all those things, but I have given you an overview about um, what is what. Yeah. Yeah, Mani. Uh, 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 I have recorded it and uh, we'll be circulating the YouTube link of uh, uh, the entire presentation and the uh, first presentation. First of all, thank you, Mani. It was a, a delightful insight which you have uh, shared with us. Uh, your hardships and uh, uh, the short truth which you have given would, uh, I think, it should help uh, everyone who is. Uh, uh, being part of this meeting and also yeah. I think uh, uh, over to Dr. Karthi Sinan and Dr. Ananda Kanan for your comments. Anand. Uh, uh, Dr. Anand sir, uh, I think you are in mute. Uh, Dr. Anand sir, you are in mute. mute. Well, uh, I have nothing much to say but hats up to Mani and um, <laughs> after the MCH you had the resolve to go through all this. <laughs> No, oh, so that's why I'm telling you, you know, like I didn't do my training here. So I came in, I did my FRCS now, and I am trying to go into the CSR route to get into the specialization, which I have not done yet, but I am trying, you know. But the, the actual true fact is, if you what have. I mean to, uh, what I mean to say is, by finishing your MCH, all your steam is gone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very true. <laughs> After that, there is very less motivation to go further. I think should yeah. we start from very young age, it becomes much easier for them to yes. go. Through. 
Yeah, very true. But the, the actual fact is, if you have very good contacts in UK and a very good relationship with any of the senior people in UK, getting into the UK and getting work things done is much, much easier. That's the actual fact. I would like to congratulate uh, Bunny actually. Thanks, because, sir. Because, like, lots of them, you want to help people. Yeah. Uh, the young surgeons to come there in a more easier route than rather yeah. than the hardship which you have undergone. I yeah. really appreciate your uh, fantastic time. Thank you, sir. That's Thank you. Thank you, sir. More comments, well, guys, sir. Uh, Oh, but, uh, guys, uh, for all the uh, PGs and other people, you know now Money Hinden, you have a contact there. Slowly you start working from now on. <laughs> no, I think all young youngsters should have a mentor. Yeah, of course, yes. That is a very, very important thing. I think yeah. uh, some of the PGs can select Money as a mentor. and it'll really... I am very, very happy to help. Very, very happy to help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from postgraduates? Uh, Dr. Dharmarajan, sir, your comments? Or if, is there any questions? Uh, if there is no questions, I'll ask some questions. Uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think Dr. Dharmarajan, yeah, Dharmarajan sir, sir has texted, actually. Uh, text it. Uh, Mani, uh, you have clearly told that uh, post uh, MCH, you have taken this route. Uh, so yes. someone who's, uh, uh, who's uh, for example, we'll give two scenarios, post MBBS. Uh, he yeah. feels that uh, maybe a son of a surgeon or someone, son of a, yeah. uh, a doctor who wants to enter UK for training alone. Uh, what you said was to go through the routine training route. That is training the easiest. Process. So instead of wasting time, so from the internship time, they can start preparing for the PLAB exams. Again, I'm telling you, PLAB exams are much, much easier than any of our NEET exams. So it is, okay. it is a majority of these exams are all clinical scenarios. So it, 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 it basically it motivates you to prepare for these exams when you start preparing for the exam. So it's all scenario based exams and um, there are enough teaching areas or coaching centers which can provide this service. So they should start uh, preparing for the exams. I would say from the final year of the exams and by internship, if they finish one, for PLAB2, they can come into the UK so for students who come in for exams like this for a specific period of time. So they can come in, finish their exams, and then apply for it. And getting any kind of training post, again, it's so if you apply, you will get a post. You won't end up not having a post unless you have very strong problems in your CV or in your application or something. See, that is that is very important because uh, yeah. uh, not everyone is uh, uh, blessed enough to have people to fund you. So, uh, so taking training as well as getting good pay is actually very important for uh, yeah. someone's career, especially in the beginning of the career. So that's, that's a fantastic thing which you're telling. And, Especially uh, the post MS graduates, I, so because recently, because of all these things, you know, who wants to get MCH? You know, it is so so difficult in in India, and uh, so coming into UK is one of the, I would say, it's one of the best ideas. You know, you come in, you train yourself in very core specialty, like you do a robotic training or you do a minimally invasive bariatric training. You do for two years, you will. I am promising you, you will get a very good training. I can tell you, it's not just on the paper. You will get a training. And somehow or other, they will make you to um, write two papers, publish two or three papers, and then you go back with the tag. This will be 100 times more weighted than your MPH degree or a DM degree back home. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And uh, uh, also for uh, someone who's, uh, as you said, someone who's trying to get into some speciality, uh, doing a speciality course in, in UK, which is going to cost you much lesser and then coming back here and getting recognized much better than your colleagues who have gone through the hardships in one of the definitely, premier definitely. institute is that's that's a shortcut yeah. for See, uh, the, the, the interesting fact is any fy1 doctor which is the internship doctor which i'm telling by fy2 hmm. fy2 all fy2 doctors they buy their own house here they buy their own house here because here the the, the 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 trend is by 18 years or 19 years, the people leave their family and come out. 
and then they start working and then they once they enter the fy1 as i told you which is an internship you will be paid from like something like 300 3000 pounds a month and everyone buys a home under a loan and they live in their own house so that kind of independence you get and even if you come here with the mindset of saving money and send back home it is again a good option people all think and someone possible. i think someone has asked a question good evening sir thank you for the talk are currently mti open for surgeons right now is mti and the itsp same okay when we came as uh, mti we can when can we later shift through trainee post oh, or intention okay. to return is compulsory yeah. so mti and I, it's not itsp it's istp i think if i'm not wrong. istp so, yeah mti yeah. and yeah. istp both are and, same and uh, just i want to just add on yeah. one thing uh, i think we are all part of the indian association of gastro and endoscopic surgeons and uh, if i'm right the fiags the fellowship which is provided by the indian association of gastro intestinal endoscopic surgeons is recognized by the itsp and okay. that is that is one more uh, added point to your cv to just yes. uh, as you were telling yeah, i think so. i think this course is I mean, whatever course you mentioned is be it's recognized by royal college actually royal yeah college it, is college college. it is recognized it yes. is recognized in fact we conducted uh, uh, dr kartisan dr anand kanan and everyone uh, dr govindraj sir and dr zameer basha was the head of it and we conducted the uh, fages recently along with the royal college attachment yeah yeah and uh, so basically so both both uh, so mti and istp are same actually and if you want to get into the uh, a trainee post you can do but as i mentioned you you should have cleared an plab exam or an mrcs if you have cleared a plab or an mrcs exam during your so what people tend to do is um, like they come in through the uh, mti program in the two year time using the uk experience they write their um, mr royal college exam because when you are working in the uk it makes their life much more easier to clear these exams because you just practice there and you write the answer whichever you are practicing so they clear the exams and then they go into um training program or whatever so if you don't get a plab or a, a royal college exam cleared then you need to get out at 24 months that's it that's it so you have to finish your uh, uh, yes. plab or yeah. whatever within that 24 months yeah, so it is, is like a, mti a, a, mti it is a fixed fixed uh, visa and a fixed uh, registration beyond that you cannot pay that and you get paid if i'm right 50 5000 so pounds? you will be paid a minimum of so minimum of say in an mti i think you will be paid somewhere around 60000 pounds a year so which comes to oh. around something like say again as like 3000 to 7 yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, one one other question uh, good evening sir i'm second year post graduate i'm just preparing for mch in urology here for training for urology in uk i understand i should complete mrcs after that sir i think it is right now you have to yeah, complete so he has to do mrcs of course he needs to do yeah. an mr say either mrcs or he has to do a plab so if he does an mrcs so he can straight away enter into st3 urology training okay and then five years of st3 urology training He, be, he gets CCT in urology, and again he has okay. to do his FRCS exam. FRCS is there to continue. FRCS is mandatory. Without FRCS, he cannot get. This. So FRCS. someone uh, out of the blue, if if someone is completing the F, uh, CCT, the complete training yeah. in a specialty, and doesn't do an FRCS, he come he, can he come back here? No, no, the, no. The intention is for, he for can't get CCT, out of it. No, the, for the CCT, oh. something again like an application which you need to put. for the cct you oh. need to submit the frcs exams results so frcs okay. exam result and so that is a train... compulsory yes. exit exam yeah 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 without frcs you cannot get cct and once the cct hmm. means you it is completion of training and you enter into the specialist register and specialist register uh, entry is mandatory for you to become a consultant in uk okay and one other question from dr harish uh, he is from kambatur finished his uh, gene surgery general surgeon so this guy so okay. harish harish Jain. i know him so he is yeah. he is from amrita i think if i am not wrong and okay. i think general <laughs> surgery in i never knew that such a short form for general surgery yeah. he thought it's only g e n it's g e n e is written so that confused me <laughs> yeah. if, if we enter is it always st3 or post mch if we get a higher post no nothing so as i mentioned to you no one recognizes your ms or mch here so even if you finish mch here and if you want to enter the training pathway you have to go back to st3 that's the reason why i didn't take st3 and i'm doing my senior clinical 
fellowship and trying the other most most difficult pathway of Caesar route to get the um, a CCT. I think someone has put Dr. up a hand. Dr. Prithvi has put up a hand. I'll just... Uh, uh, Dr. Prithvi, I think you can uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Dr. Prithvi. I am your junior from PSG. Uh, oh. Sir, first of all, uh, fantastic presentation, sir. Uh, yeah. Like, such a structured presentation, like, I, it was very hard for me to come by, even in YouTube and all that. So, mm -hmm. uh, happy to attend your presentation, sir. Sir, uh, my doubt is uh, actually something you brief you have briefly touched upon, but I'd like uh, even more confirmation. Sir, uh, my current situation, okay, basically, I'm uh, my plan is to enter the uh, ST3 pathway, sir. I'm giving my MRCS exam, and then uh, my plan is to enter the ST3 pathway and eventually get my CCT and uh, be become a consultant. That's my long-term plan, sir. But uh, right now, the doubt I'm having is, uh, doing a PG in a private uh, medical institution, I... <clears throat> I did not get much uh, surgical training, sir. Like, my theory knowledge is good, but my hands are not uh, that great. And uh, the two schools of thought I keep hearing is, one is, before you enter into the UK, you work in a high volume center for at least a year or two, uh, get good hands before you go. That is one school of thought. The other one is, no matter what we learn here, uh, uh, in the UK, they are going to train you all the way from scratch. So, instead of wasting your time here, enter into the pathway as soon as possible and then get into the training is the other school of thought. So, uh, so, so I would I would advise you to take the the second second pathway you know don't waste time yeah uh, and uh, as a surgeon we would never be happy with whatever training we get okay even now I cry that I'm not doing anything and everyone does that you know so um, what I would advise you is um, don't waste time so st3 is a it's, it's the very beginning of a specialty training. So, and they don't expect you to do wonders. So, if you, if you, if you, as an ST3, I would, I would um, think that, so if you can put in a laparoscopic port and if you can do a basic laparotomy, it's more than enough. That is the basic requirement which they might expect. Although I'm not sure on this, I should not tell false things here, but this is what is expected from an ST3 person here when I work. So when I work here and if some ST3 person comes here, the maximum thing which we will ask them to do is close the laparotomy wound or try to put in a port and we will supervise. So don't waste time. Don't work in high volume center. If your interest is coming in, I am telling you, so even if you start from now, it takes one and a half to two years. So in that time, you can use it, but don't, waste time working there and then start your application process which will take another one and a half years the other option what you can do is once you've done your mrcs you can come in as a junior fellow or a senior fellow work in some unit here and then you can apply and get the st3 post also that's also an option okay. and uh, so even in that uh, pathway that you're saying that after finish my mrcs even then uh, they are not expecting much competency from my end is that what you're saying sir like is it not okay if so basically what they expect is they need to know you should have a basic surgical skill that is called as the core, core surgical training, CT1 and CT2. So oh. core surgical training is you should know how to handle these instruments, how to put, uh, how to handle sutures, basic suturing techniques, putting uh, lines, putting a chest tube, something like that. That's all. I think that's more than enough. Okay. Okay. okay sir. Thank you so much. And sir. on the other hand, on the other hand, how much ever you are trained, you are not going to have any extra points on that. I'm telling oh. you, no one is recognized, going to recognize you if you tell that I have done so much back home, but you have done this alone. No one is going to recognize you. So don't waste time. So maintaining a logbook right now also doesn't matter much. Extreme, no, it is extremely important. Please, so please maintain a logbook. Okay. So from your training, from your scratch, from day one of your training, please do it. Although we were all lacking in it. I, I personally lacked in it, but somehow... We worked in an institution where it's all computerized. So I gathered my information, but still the main advice, which I failed to add in this. So everyone should maintain a logbook from day one, whatever you do, whatever procedure you do, whatever, and then try to get some feedbacks also, you know. So once you present something, uh, get some feedback from your uh, mentors or a moderator or a unit chief. At the, once you finish your unit and go, get a writing, written feedback from them telling how you work and things like that. This all will add when you come into UK. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prithvi. Uh, and one other, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the questions will be flowing to money, I guess. So uh, what I request from everyone is uh, please uh, make note of uh, money's uh, uh, yes. WhatsApp number and emails and uh, uh, push in all your questions there. He's happy to answer uh, everyone. I am. Yeah, uh, I am happy uh, to answer. Yeah, no problem at all. Yes. 
and uh, one, one last question mani yes. uh, ponnagiri dilipan uh, he is uh, he is currently doing his mch cardiothoracic surgery what is the route and chances of training in uk and uh, to come back to india he wants to come back to india okay. what he is asking is should so he do for... an mrcs or a mpa yeah. so cardiothoracic surgery again it's it's one of the one of the top unit top training programs you have in uk i think uh, the big centers like papworth and hafield are here in which i think many indian surgeons are there actually so the best thing for for you i would suggest is mti because you going back and doing an mrcs now will be very very difficult because you have been doing cardiothoracic surgery and mrcs is like you need to go back study breast thyroid varicose veins you need to study ortho which is very very difficult so i think for you the best thing is mti and i am telling you 100% you will get a spot in one of the because because there are only very few high end cardiothoracic surgery units which provides mti service so you will be placed in one of these units and you can get trained and come back i think you should go through mti so i think uh, that sunset and uh, uh, please may, uh, if at all you are not able to reach out to manigandan you can reach me to reach his uh, contacts uh, and thank you everyone i i request dr saumia uh, who was our secretary uh, saumia is a, a breast surgeon and uh, she is from uh, sr medical college uh, to uh, deliver the vote of thanks thank you mani thanks thanks uh, thank you dr rajveer now uh, just like uh, dr anand said i wish uh, we had known you or met you like 10 to 12 years ago sir <laughs> so but your talk was really very helpful and honest that's the next thing i would uh, yeah. like to say. Yeah. really thank you so much for you know uh, making yourself available for so many people and younger surgeons now yeah. i would li- like to thank uh, dr anand my senior and uh, friend Uh, for being there uh, for the presentation and also all his inputs and kartizan sir thank you so much uh, he was my uh, again teacher and uh, at srm and uh, then a small mention of i mean uh, we are really happy about the attendance here uh, we did not uh, you know uh, expect so much but then i'm really happy that so many people are there because the talk was so good and uh, i would like to thank uh, kg sir uh, yegnathan sir dharma sir uh, parshati sir and uh, stalin prakasham sir and also from uh, you know coimbatore tanjore and all the doctors who had joined from there dr sharada dr praveen dr rajiv raj all these people thank you so much for joining in and uh, Cheers! Really nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, and, it's a virtual cheers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Rajivel, uh, Rajivel, if 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 any of these post graduates wants any specific uh, topic on say and how about an MRCS exam or PLAB exam or want to take through the training route or whatever related to you related to UK training, I am happy to take a session for them either through ASA or through Medical College or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm happy. Yeah. And we have quite a few friends who are really doing this kind of work. helping students and uh, so we can do that yeah i think dr saumya and uh, dr kartik if he is uh, part of it dr kartisen and dr anand kanan i think uh, with all yeah. your words <laughs> money will be more busy than, than searching the liver <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah so who be there and uh, even for lady surgeons whatever options are there i would like you to you know help yeah them. definitely that will be a very good topic actually yeah just for lady stage and he yes. is very happy to share <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah once you become a surgeon you're no more a lady no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but then that's what i thought when i just passed out of ms then life teaches you yes you are a lady so if we have yeah. options can earn equal to men with definitely little, i would really let them know yeah 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 them. yeah that's fine so if you are working in srm so if you want any sessions to be done or especially if you want to organize something for maybe lady surgeons i am very very happy and i have few other speakers if you want specifically say if you want to give talk on breast surgery or oncoplastic surgery or whatever we can make arrangements actually mbbs who are just finishing uh, and trying to you know clear need so yeah. they also very happy to you know. very true very true
but uh, the news of uh, neat is uh, tougher than plan just broke my heart <laughs> no no it's very very true it is neat exam so the, the reason why many students come to uk is because of this neat you know it is so difficult and then the reservations uh, attached to it is so difficult so so difficult yeah see even you enter uk at least you still have something yeah dharma sir want to talk some yeah 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 yes sir yes i am just listening to you all like thank, thank you, you thank you sir thank you mk thank you nice meeting you hello manigandan kadirvel one day thank you thank you sir thank you sir <laughs> thank you it's very nice talking to you mk thank you thank sir. you very much for your valuable information thank and you sir help also so uh, the reason there is why no they other are made, the reason yes, why sir? they are made need so difficult is uh india we do lot of work here compared to western countries yeah we are performing lot of academic and achievements in all fields but still our indian degree is not recognized in anywhere very true sir yeah if you compare the indian doctors who trained here they do better in uk and us yes. than the fellows there in europe knowledge wise skill wise confident wise but still our degree is not recognized everywhere Yeah. So that is why our government wants to make the standard of our exams to be higher than the west as well as the asian thing so that is yeah. the only reason they made this neat exam a compulsory and they are making yeah. it more difficult to yeah. bring the best ones out yeah. so in another 5 years or 10 years you can see our indian degree will be recognized throughout the world like yeah so as you, as you told sir to... yeah yes sir yeah definitely well said sir well said Dharma, no, as you as you told, sir. Basically, no, no. the the, in, in the basic fact is. In five to ten years. Yeah. In next ten years, you see, people will be rushing to India to get get learn like. Very true. Come here very for true. Training. Very true. It's so as you, it. yeah, as you told very clearly. So most say in the UK, if they stop the surgeons or doctors coming from UK into means from India into UK, the entire system will collapse. So so in my department where we have fifty doctors, we twenty two are from India. Twenty two doctors are from India. In that, I am proud to say that seven are Tamil people. Actually, seven seven surgeons are from Tamil Nadu. Actually, so the so it is like so I I I don't feel anything different from how I work in back home. You know, it's it's like India. You know, all people are Indian surgeons and this one. So they are always outsmart. They always outsmart any other European Union people or whoever. And um, the no second of Bodhaya. the sad part is in and the the degrees the ms degrees from pakistan is recognized ms degree from bangladesh is recognized but the ms degree from india is not recognized that's a oh. that's a fact. yeah so things are like that so if you had an ms degree from um, pakistan you get gmc registration straight you don't need a plab or uh, a mrcs you know but i was I told in the other uh, way. So i was told enough. no no i was told in the other way like why intentionally this was kept by the indian medical council is they don't want indians to move out of the country they don't like people moving out of the country so intentionally the indian medical council or whatever doesn't want their degree equally fitted with the western side. that's what they told i don't know but but this is this is the fact uh, one more thing is yes sir uh, in india the university system is not national level like Yeah. It is of the state level, district level, yeah. and autonomous. So many things are here. Whereas in other countries, it's only a national level. Yes, a single sir. university holds controls everything. Like, yeah. So it becomes easy for them to standardize and regularize everything. Yeah. But in India, for the population and the benefit of the people who are coming from baseline, so we have this system for yeah. easy, easy approach to the university. Like. True. So that is the reason our degree is not standardized, and they are not accepting it. That is yeah. the reason now the central government has taken up everything. They are making it into a national board, right Very from true. our NEET examinations, selections. Everything is going to be under one board, like mm-hmm. national yeah. board. Mm-hmm. As it becomes a national board for a couple of years, automatically the it becomes equal to Western Very like. True. very true very true yeah. yeah by 2025 you can see our indian degrees will be more valid than uh, 10 yeah. years hopefully sir yes sir definitely thank you sir 
thank you sir thank you sir uh, if there is no further questions i think uh, thank you mani thank Thanks you Anand, sir thank you dharma sir thank you karthik yeah, sir thank, thank you soumya ma'am yeah, thank you topic. rajiv sir wonderful topic thank you thank you sir yeah, thank, thank you, you sir uh, unfortunately we cannot uh, 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 treat ourselves <laughs> with the routine <laughs> fellowships Uh, hope uh, we'll uh, all join together and have money here once he is here uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, for some time vaanga mk vaanga oor kandipa kandipa sir kandipa sir kandipa sir money you will enjoy the trichis hospitality 100% welcome <laughs> 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 na nah, salem da sir na nah, i am from salem thank you thank you money thank you okay. thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you very much good night bye bye bye